I'm John Steele. I've been in the computer business since 1963. Mm -hmm. I chose computing as a career in 1958 on a school trip to Manchester University, which set my career in progress. The Argus 100 is a machine which, when I joined Ferranti in 63, was just going into production. The first two machines were on the factory floor. It was based on the earlier Argus, later renamed the Argus 200 machine, which was designed for a Bloodhound military launch computer. But that basically defined the architecture. It was a new machine that was made by Ferrantes for process control. That was the target marketplace. The Argus 100 was designed as a lower cost machine, lower cost being somewhat relative. And the first one was for Jodrell Bank to control the Mark II telescope. And the second one was for Steel Peach and Toza. It had 32 instructions, of which 30 were used from memory. I've not actually checked on the manual just recently. Um, which would basically do add, subtract, multiply, divide, shift and test. That was basically it. The front panel was used to initially load programs into the computer and then to monitor the operation of the computer once the program was actually running. You started off by putting the address you wanted to load the data into, this is from reading from the tape, on the hand keys, the least significant 14 bits were the address, the other bits were ignored. Then press the the start button and then moved it up to the tape button it would then start reading the tape. You then could select the start address that you wanted the program to be and then you could press the run button to actually just start running the program from that point. The display is normally would show the current program instruction on these single bit displays. It was a binary display it displayed the instruction on the left hand 24 bits and the register, which was one of the internal registers of the computer doing the arithmetic, on the right hand side. Normally, those would just be set to display continuously as the machine was running. And it's surprising how much information you could get from those machines about whether the mach what the machine was actually doing. You could just see the patterns that were running. And then you could stop the machine, you could single step it with where the registers became quite useful. If you were debugging your program, you could actually step through the instructions and watch the instruction appear and the data appear and the results appear in the register display. That was our only debugging tools. The way of getting data into the machine was via paper tape fundamentally. Disk drives came a lot later on. Uh, so we had five old tape on the Argus 100. We changed over to using 8-hole tape for the Argus 400, but the two were compatible. The machine was designed so you could read machine code directly into it. So you could type those in on a teleprinter as numeric codes. You could use character returns and line feeds, it carefully ignored those. So you could program a numeric machine code. Very restrictive because the operand, the end part of the instruction, it had to be an absolute address. Makes life tricky. Programmers don't like that. But the sole means of communicating out from it was a teleprinter for visual output and a paper tape punch for ordinary output. I should have said in terms of output though, of course, that the plants would quite often customise build panels which would display numeric displays and various things like that. So there were other displays, but the standard was nothing. Um, places like Jodrell Bank would have all sorts of displays coming out of this thing, so we had a, one of the I.O. modules would actually display decimal outputs on panel displays, but they were all custom built for specific customers. There was no general things. Hand switches, again, if they wanted hand switches, we could do hand switches on a panel and read them in, in a single bit input. So we did custom displays, but they were all customised for each individual project. The computers we designed at Ferrantes, a single JK flip-flop, a single bi-stable, was a week and a half's salary. I was getting paid £17, 10 shillings when I started as a graduate engineer in 1963. The JK flip-flop was £25 cost. To put some other benchmarks there, two years later, I bought a house for about £3,000. I bought a car for £450 new. That's again another indication of how costs have changed. As a junior engineer at the age of 22, I was able to buy a house. It's difficult to do that these days. 
but the costs have changed dramatically over the years, downwards. When I left Ferrantes, we were paying 22p for JK flip-flops, not £25. So, costs changed even during the time I was there. The costs really tumbled and it changed the whole way in which things worked. Ferrantes was a strange company. Um, in those days, companies were very stuffy and formal. Most companies, everyone was on surname terms rather than first name terms. I didn't realise this till much later because Ferrantes was on first name terms, which I discovered later was very unusual. There were only two people in the company who got first na uh, surname terms, which was Dr. Searby, who was the chairman, and Norman Best, uh, Dennis Best, sorry, who was the chief engineer. And they were called Mr. Best, um, Dr. Searby. Everyone else was first name terms. Seemed okay to me, but it discovered later that was most unusual. It was a friendly place to work. I was known by the chief engineer, although well, I was a junior engineer. He knew my first name almost straight away. I know he was on the interview board that interviewed me, which was a daunting exercise in itself, which is perhaps worth a mention. Then I graduated at the age of 20, so I was fairly young and wet behind the ears. Went into the boardroom for an interview with five people sat behind the huge board table. I could just about see them on the other side. Dennis Best was leading the interview panel for graduate engineers, which seemed very strange. And the thing that was even more strange is I was given a nod by one of the people giving... It was a full day interview. Tour of the factory, an hour interview. I was given a nod before the end of the day that they were going to offer me a job, which was most surprising. So I took it and uh, I, was, I was very happy at Ferrantes for the seven years I worked there. Well, the first project I started off by helping to debug the hardware on the steel peach and tozer machine. Finished that and then they said, right, now we want you to design a computer. Which was a bit of a surprise. I didn't know anything about logic design. I'd done university, which at Manchester University, electrical engineering degree. The nearest I could get to computing in 1960 when I went to university. And most of the course to do with computing, because they did computing, which is why I went there, was to do with transistors and circuit theory. I expected to be a circuit designer. They said, we're designing this new range of integrated circuits to make a computer out of it. We want you to design the computer. This is the instruction set. It had to be based on the Argus 100, which you've got one in the museum. But after that, you've got a free reign. You can do what you like. It just has to obey the same instruction set. You can copy the code, the logic exactly if you wish, with minor changes because the integrated circuits were slightly different. You have a completely free reign. So that was my first job. It took two years then to get it into production. Ferrantes had to make the ICs. We made them in-house in a lab. They had to work out how to lay out multi-layer printed circuit boards, which was new. I wasn't involved in all of this, but this was all the technology that had to go into it. We had to learn how to plate through holes on multi-layer boards. We had to learn how to bond multi-layer boards together. And all that took about two, two and a half years to actually get into production. Then the first machine came out and I was then Mr. August 400 and debugged the first six off the production line. But in the meantime, we had a few other thing, projects that we worked on as well. I did some work on the August 100 after the 400, designing I.O. equipment, helping to sort out machines that were on the factory floor because they were all hand-wired. The back frames were all hand-wired, no printed circuits with the back frames, which is modular boards. So there were wiring errors made when they putting things together, so you had to debug each machine separately. I assisted on some of those. Maybe even the one on the museum, I can't remember, because about quite a few machines went through. I worked on about five or six of them. The probability is I worked on that one, but I can't remember.